This is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Stella Nickel? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Stella Nickel was born in Colton, Oregon on August 7, 1943. At age 16, she became pregnant. She would have a daughter named Cynthia. She moved to Southern California, found a lover, and married. She had another daughter while living there. Stella ran into some trouble with the law a number of times. She was convicted of fraud in 1968. In 1969, she was charged with beating her daughter with a curtain rod and in 1971, she was convicted of forgery. Stella met a man named Bruce Nickel in 1974, and they became romantically involved. Bruce had difficulty regulating his intake of alcohol. In 1976, Stella and Bruce married. They lived in Auburn, Washington. Bruce worked as a heavy equipment operator. Stella worked as a security screener at Seattle Tacoma International Airport. Stella convinced Bruce to stop drinking because he was spending too much money on alcohol. But then she wasn't happy when he did stop because she had no one with whom to drink. She felt as though Bruce was limiting her ability to have fun. Before moving to the timeline of the crime, let's hear a word from today's sponsor, Factor. Fitness starts with food, and Factor makes it possible for you to achieve your daily goals through nutritious, purposeful eating. Factor offers keto, calorie smart, chef's choice, and vegan plus veggie options, which include seafood, meat, and plant-based meals. With Factor, there is no prep and no mess. Factor cuts out stressful meal planning and extensive preparation, so meals come together in minutes, taking the guesswork out of what to make for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Factor meals arrive pre-prepared and ready to eat in two minutes, even faster than ordering takeout. Choose your favorite meals, or let Factor craft your order based on your taste preferences and meal history. Factor is a go-to lunch or dinner solution when I'm working late making videos, which for me is pretty often. Factor is so flexible, I can easily adjust my order size, enjoy with loved ones, or even skip a week when I have a special event. Head to go.factor75.com slash drgrande120 and use code drgrande120 to get $120 off. That's $120 off with the code Dr. Grande 120 at go.factor75.com slash Dr. Grande 120. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On June 5, 1986, Stella's husband Bruce arrived at the single wide trailer where the couple lived. He had just finished work. He consumed four extra strength Excedrin capsules in an effort to treat a headache. He collapsed just minutes later. Stella called for help at 5.02 p.m. Bruce died the next day at a local hospital. The physicians believed that Bruce died from emphysema. Six days later, a 40-year-old woman named Sue Snow, who was a bank manager in Auburn, consumed two Excedrin capsules to treat a headache. Her husband also consumed two capsules around the same time to treat arthritis. Sue's 15-year-old daughter found Sue at 6.30 a.m. on the floor of the bathroom. Sue was unresponsive. Her daughter called for help and Sue was transported to the hospital where she died later that same day. The assistant medical examiner noticed the scent of bitter almonds while performing the autopsy. This is an odor associated with cyanide. Tests were performed which confirmed that Sue died of acute cyanide poisoning. The police searched Sue's residence and found a bottle of Excedrin. Three of the remaining capsules in the bottle contained cyanide. Not long after this, another contaminated bottle of Excedrin was found in a grocery store near Kent, Washington. Bristol Myers, the company that manufactured Excedrin, recalled all Excedrin products in the Seattle area. It's interesting because around the same time, Excedrin had a very successful TV and print ad with the tagline, I have a headache this big and it's got Excedrin written all over it. I guess they didn't want to rebrand their product with a new slogan based on homicide. But if they did, they could have gone with the slogan, Headaches or Murder, So is Excedrin, 
Or are you troubled by a headache and your husband? Extra murder, etc. will take care of both. A number of drug companies offered a $300,000 reward for the arrest of the person responsible for the poisoning. The vigorous reaction to the tampered products could be partly attributed to the Chicago Tylenol murders, which had just occurred about four years earlier. In September and October of 1982, seven people died in the Chicago metropolitan area after consuming Tylenol products laced with potassium cyanide. That case was never solved. On June 19, 1986, Stella Nichol contacted the police and told them that her husband Bruce died suddenly after taking Excedrin capsules. She turned over two bottles of Excedrin to the police. The lot number on the bottles matched the one from the Sioux Snow case. Five days later, another contaminated bottle of medication was discovered. This newly discovered bottle was a different product, but it was found in the same store where Sue had purchased the contaminated Excedrin. Investigators were unable to find any trace of cyanide anywhere in the production facilities for the medications. They concluded that the manufacturer was not responsible for the poisoning. The contamination must have occurred after the bottles were shipped to the stores probably by an end user. This moved the investigation in the direction of people who were in possession of the Excedrin bottles, namely Stella Nickel and Sue Snow's husband. Examination of the contaminated bottles revealed not only cyanide, but an algae side that was sold under the brand name Algae Destroyer. This product is typically used in home aquariums. As the police continued their investigation, they found evidence that Stella may have been involved in the poisonings. She claimed that she purchased the two Excedrin bottles at different times and probably in different locations. Considering that only five contaminated bottles were discovered, it seems unlikely that Stella would just happen to purchase two of them through random error alone. Stella had purchased Algae Destroyer from a local store. The police thought that maybe that chemical became mixed with cyanide because Stella crushed both substances in the same bowl. Stella had recently taken out $76,000 worth of life insurance policies on her husband, but in the event of an accidental death, she would get an extra $100,000. Two of the life insurance policies contained a forged signature. Bruce had never signed them. Stella had argued with the physicians who determined her husband's cause of death. She insisted they were incorrect. Stella did this even before Sue Snow died. The police believed Stella was responsible but they could not prove she had ever obtained cyanide. The case against her wasn't strong enough to push forward. Stella's daughter Cynthia contacted the police in January 1987. Cynthia made a series of allegations against her mother. She said that her mother had frequently discussed how she wanted Bruce to die. Stella specifically mentioned how she was bored with him because he stopped consuming alcohol. Stella said that she had tried to poison him on a prior occasion with another substance but failed. After this, Stella visited the Auburn Public Library to research more lethal methods. This is when she stumbled upon cyanide. Stella talked with Cynthia about what they could do with all the insurance money after Bruce died. The police visited the Auburn Public Library and identified books that Stella had checked out. Several of the books were about poison, including a book titled Deadly Harvest and a book titled Human Poisonings from Native and Cultivated Plants. The latter book had never been returned to the library. I guess the book Poisoning Your Spouse for Beginners had already been checked out. It's a popular title, and many people who check it out get arrested, so they don't return it to the library. Stella's fingerprints and palm prints were found in three encyclopedias in the library. All of them were volumes covering the letter C. Her prints were specifically found on pages discussing cyanide. It appears as though Stella should have also checked out the topic covering one's tracks while she was in the volumes covering the letter C. On December 9, 1987, Stella was arrested after being indicted by a federal grand jury on five counts of product tampering, including two counts resulting in death. In May 1988, she was found guilty on all charges. She was sentenced to two 90-year terms, one for each death and three 10-year terms for the remaining product tampering charges. All the sentences were to run concurrently. Stella was first eligible for parole in 2018 and will be released no later than July 2040. Now moving to my analysis. 
Was Stella Nickel actually guilty of product tampering? Many people believe that she was not guilty, and Stella has always maintained her innocence. Let's take a look at the factors both for and against the idea that Stella was guilty, starting with the inculpatory evidence. Stella's claim about buying the two bottles at different times, and probably in different locations, is very unlikely. She may have talked about wanting Bruce dead. She checked out books from the library about poison. Her fingerprints and palm prints were found on encyclopedia pages discussing cyanide. She challenged the physicians who incorrectly attributed her husband's death to emphysema. The insurance policies paid extra in the event of accidental death. Bruce's signature was forged on two of the life insurance policies. And Algae Destroyer was mixed in with the cyanide Stella had purchased Algae Destroyer. Moving to the exculpatory factors, there is no video of Stella committing the crime, no witnesses, there are no fingerprints on the Excedrin bottles. There is no evidence that Stella ever possessed cyanide. Stella's daughter Cynthia was paid $250,000 in reward money for assisting the prosecution. Cynthia had a history of substance use, and her relationship with her mother was described as combative. Other people involved in the case were given reward money as well, including a neighbor who unsuccessfully searched Stella's home for algae destroyer and the manager of the store that sold the algae destroyer. When considering all the evidence in this case, do I think that Stella Nickel was guilty? I think she was guilty in reality and guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The compelling evidence was her claim about buying the two bottles at different times and probably in different locations. 15,000 bottles were tested in the area and only five contained cyanide. It's unlikely that one person would end up with both bottles. Stella was arrested and convicted because she didn't understand probability theory. If she had never made that statement to the police, it's very unlikely she would have been prosecuted. Here are my thoughts on a few other items that stood out to me in this case. Item number one, Stella was willing to harm others to convince the authorities that her husband's death was random. The cyanide-laced pills killed one additional victim, but could have killed several people. Stella Nickel had a phenomenal lack of empathy. She did not care who suffered or died so that she could get her way. Item number two, this case is extremely unusual in that a wife killed her husband and was able to get away with it. Again, the cause of death was determined to be emphysema. After getting away with it, she desperately tried to convince the authorities that her husband was murdered. Typically, if a murderer is able to cover up their crime, they consider that a victory. That's just something a killer normally takes as a win not something they need to remedy. The problem for Stella is that she was greedy. She wanted the extra $100,000 from the life insurance policies, and she could only get it if Bruce's death was considered accidental. Item number three. One of the major keys to Stella being convicted was the testimony of her daughter. Outside of this, the evidence was circumstantial. Stella had not treated Cynthia well, yet felt comfortable sharing with her information about wanting Bruce dead. Here we see that Stella had a lack of awareness about the quality of her relationship with her daughter. She probably never imagined that Cynthia would turn her in to the authorities. Now moving to the last item, number four. Stella's motive was partially formed through boredom, which occurred when Bruce stopped drinking at her request. This illustrates a key concept in the world of substance use, namely how it is connected to relationships. People often use drugs and alcohol with other people. Bruce had accomplished something quite impressive by getting clean, but he found himself in a bad situation because his wife continued drinking. The couple found themselves mismatched and incompatible. This case exemplifies how maintaining unhealthy relationships can destroy a person's attempt to recover from substance use. Sometimes when a person abandons a substance, they must also abandon everything and everyone connected to that substance if they want to maximize their chances of remaining sober. It's an unfortunate reality of substance use. Those are my thoughts in the case of Stella Nickel. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis to be as intriguing as a homicidal over-the-counter medication ad campaign. Thanks for watching.